I'm so thankful to the Lord for Israel and for his faithfulness week after week, day after today, to lead us into the very presence of the Lord through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs that are glorifying to the Lord and are filled with the most potent theological truth, and I'm thankful for that. You may have never heard the name of Mr. Ira Yates. He was, like many other ranchers and farmers during the era of the Great Depression in this country, he had a lot of land, but he also had a lot of debt. He was so in debt, he could not even afford to make his mortgage payments or pay the interest or the principal in any way. He was in danger of losing his ranch. And with barely enough money for food and clothing for his family, like many others, he had to live with the assistance of government subsidies. Day after day, his cattle and sheep grazed those rolling West Texas hills. And he was troubled, as you can imagine, about how he was possibly going to pay his bills. And then one day, a seismographic crew from an oil company came into his area, told him they didn't know, but there could be oil on his land. And they asked permission to drill a wildcat well. And he signed a lease contract. At 1,115 feet, they struck a huge oil reserve. The first well came in at 80,000 barrels a day. Many other wells were subsequently drilled, many of them twice as large as that original. In fact, 30 years later, after this great discovery, a government test of one of the wells showed that it still had the potential flow of 125,000 barrels of oil a day. And Mr. Yates owned it all. The day he purchased the land, he had received the oil and mineral rights. Yet, he'd been living in poverty on government assistance. Can you imagine a multi-millionaire living in poverty? What was the problem? Well, obviously, he didn't know the oil was there or even that he owned it. I think it's fair to say that we're a lot like Mr. Yates, at times anyway. We are the heirs of a vast, innumerable fortune, treasure, yet we live so often in spiritual poverty. So often we exercise such weak and minimal faith when we have the riches of Christ at our disposal. We are entitled as co-heirs with Christ, as children of God, to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, His energizing power, and yet we live unaware of our birthright. So today we gather in part to remember how rich we are. Oh, not rich by the world standards. Although as a Western country, as the United States of America, everyone in this room is in the top percentile of wealth in the entire world, financially, monetarily speaking. We're not concerned about that. We're concerned about our spiritual wealth. Because human resources, physical resources, material things waste away. They fade. They rot. They rust. They tarnish. They break. In fact, should the Lord tarry, should He allow this world to 
exist another thousand years in its current form. Everything that you own and you cherish in terms of material things will be gone. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul is reminding the church at Ephesus and I believe others on a circuit that would read this letter of the blessings, the spiritual riches they have in Christ. And we're looking at it in the context of a series called The Christian Life, Riches and Responsibilities, because with great wealth comes great responsibility. Look at chapter 1, verses 15 through the end of the chapter. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe, according to the working of His great might, that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above rule and authority, all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in also in the one to come. And He put all things under His feet and gave Him as head over all things to the church which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. What an amazing passage of Scripture reminding us of our wealth. And what we have to keep in mind is we will, as a church, as a covenant community, as individual believers, we will never reach our full potential as the church until we realize the power of the kingdom available to us. The implications of this text are astonishing. We are so small-minded in what we think about the nature of our relationship to the Lord and salvation. I'm afraid the extent of our thought about the Lord throughout the week is often reduced to, yeah, I go to church on Sunday, I listen to somebody preaching and we sing songs, and because of that I know that I have forgiveness of sin, so when I die I won't go to hell, I'll go to heaven. And that's the extent. If you are asked to affirm any number of doctrinal statements, oh yeah, you'll give lip service to it. I'll say, yeah, that's right, we believe that. But do we really stop and pause and consider how life-transforming it is that our heart of stone has been replaced with a heart of flesh and that the law of the Lord has been written on our hearts and that we are co-heirs with Christ that the Creator of the universe has redeemed us, has brought us up out of those ashes we sang of a moment ago, has brought us up out of the miry clay of sin and death that entraps us like quicksand and has plucked us and placed us on the rock-solid, firm foundation of Jesus Christ who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What confidence for living it gives us that Jesus, who was dead, is alive again. That is not a quaint little truth that we place alongside the Easter bunny. 
That is universe impacting reality. It makes such a difference when we understand the gospel and that it is good news. It is better than anything this world can offer. We take joy in the simplest things. We entertain ourselves. We occupy our minds with books or television or movies or phones. All the while neglecting the most precious truth that we know, and that is that this one who was dead and is alive again, this Jesus of Nazareth dwells with us and empowers us by His Spirit to live a life to the glory of God and to the fame and renown of the triune God. Paul spends the first few verses of Ephesians here mining this incredible treasure trove of riches available to us in Christ. And now in the verses we just read in verse 15, he prays that the content of the truth that he shared will be actively lived out and practiced in the lives of the believers that he's writing to and to us by extension. And how does he do this? He prays. It is not uncommon, in fact, it is rather common in Paul's epistles that he divides his letter into two halves for the most part. The first half we'll call the indicative. The second half is the imperative. In other words, in the first part of the epistle, he says, this is the truth. This is who you are. This is who Christ is. And this is who you are in Christ. And then in the second half of the book, he says, now this is what you're to do and this is who you're to be on the basis of who you are in Christ. Notice this in Ephesians. We can see it clearly. In in chapter 1, he's talking about blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. He's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. That's verse number 3. He goes on to list this beautiful laundry list of blessings in Christ that He chose us, that we would be holy and blameless. He predestined us. He adopted us according to His will, to the praise of His grace. He's blessed us in the Beloved. We have redemption, that is forgiveness through His blood. That He's lavished upon us this grace that has revealed the mystery that was heretofore unknown. We've obtained an inheritance according to the counsel of His will, to the praise of His glory. To see this list of all these things. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit. He continues to do this as well as pray for them as we're seeing this morning. But then notice what happens in chapter 4. Chapter 4, he says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So he urges these Ephesian Christians to live out who they are. Be who you are in Christ. And then that takes a number of different manifestations. He talks about the nature of the new life compared to the old life. He talks about what it looks like to walk in love with each other. What it looks like to live lives of holiness. Toward the end of the book, he gives explicit instructions about how wives and husbands and children are to relate to each other. He gives us this beautiful um, battle gear for spiritual warfare helping us to actually face the schemes of the enemy. And the way that he moves from content to practice is through prayer. 
He prays. He tells them who they are in chapter 1 that we just reviewed briefly. And then he prays that that will become the reality in their life. They will live like who they are. Unlike Mr. Yates, who lived in poverty, not knowing he was a millionaire, but that we as the children of God would live as children of God, spending time with Him, loving Him, serving Him, sharing His Word. So what we learn from this passage, at least in part, is that prayer is the only way or, or the primary way that objective truth about who God is becomes personal action and discipleship. So let me say that again. So when you, you come to understand who God is, according to Scripture, how does that then translate into not just orthodoxy, but orthopraxy, putting into practice? One of the main means is through prayer. Lord, teach me to live according to the truth that I know in the gospel. Help me, Lord, to live as a redeemed, saved, justified, adopted child of God. Verse 14 is the end of the section that we'll call the, the eulogy. Now, you think of a funeral when you hear eulogy, but the word actually just means good word. So he's talking about how good God is, how blessed we are in the Lord. And then, beginning in verse 15, he shifts to a more familiar kind of prayer and thanksgiving for the people. Now, Paul had left Ephesus for the last time around 57 A.D., and he writes this epistle from a Roman prison cell about five or six years later. Now, he spent three and a half years in Ephesus. And Ephesus, his account in Acts, and then what we read uh, also in Ephesus and other places, in Ephesians and other places, he spent a considerable amount of time teaching them teaching them day and night for three and a half years. And so this is a group of people who are intimately close to Paul. He is still, after this time of five, six years, faithfully living up to his promise to continue to remember them in prayer. He's faithfully lifting up the Ephesian saints in his daily prayers. This is how Paul lived out this admonition to pray without ceasing, pray without stopping. I want to challenge us to do something. I've been convicted about this recently in my own life when it comes to prayer. It's not hard to do. Let's, let's commit our covenant together to do it. Each day, I would imagine, numerous people tell you about something that they're going through, some need that they have, some prayer concern. And our response is inevitably what? I'll pray for you. Why not just pray for them? Right then. Why don't we have to calendar it for like sometime later in the week? If you have time to say, I'll pray for you, you have time to pray for them. And I'm not talking about, you don't have to be an exhaustive, you know, prayer with fancy theological words. It's just a simple prayer. Lord, be present. Let the gospel be manifested in this person's life, in this person's difficulty, in this person's tragedy, in this person's suffering. Lord, make your name great through the testimony of this person. Let people see Christ in the way that they're handling this difficulty, this circumstance, this hardship, the disease in the life of a loved one, a terminal loved one, whatever it might be. Speak through prayer to God as you simultaneously speak the gospel into the life 
of the person that God has put in front of you. To be a minister of the gospel in that moment. Just consider that. In, in that moment of the 7 billion people on the face of the earth, God has chosen you to be the one to speak His word and encouragement in the gospel into the life of that person. In that moment, who God chose was you. And you can choose to pass that by. And I think we do, not out of any ill intent, but just through kind of cliche, I'll be praying for you. Will you? Let's just do it. That way, if we just do it right there on the spot, we're never guilty of lying. How many times have you told somebody you would pray for them and it never crossed your mind again? Well, unintended, you didn't intend to lie to that person, but when it's all said and done, you lied. You said you would pray for them, and you didn't. So let's avoid even the possibility of lying by just praying with the person. Do we have time to do that? If we knew the reality of the power of prayer, if we truly believed in the power of prayer, working compatibly in concert with the sovereign will of God, not contrary to the will of God, we would be in prayer all the time, as Paul was. Right? I don't, I, don't think we, I don't think we really believe what we say we believe. Not only in terms of prayer, and I know that's kind of harsh to say, but if we really believe the gospel is what it is, how can we just celebrate that on Sunday? Why would we not celebrate that every day, every moment? That you were dead and now in Christ you are alive again. That Christ was dead and He is alive because He lives. We love to sing at Easter. Because He lives. Not only can I face tomorrow, I can face today. And friends, if He is not alive, I cannot face today. There is no point in facing today. But if He is alive, everything matters. Because everywhere I am, at every moment of every day, I am an ambassador of Jesus Christ, that in that moment, I am glorifying God in the space that He has given me to the person that He's put in front of me. And I fail at that miserably. Because at some level, any time there's disobedience, the root of that is sin, and the sin is some level of unbelief. That we're not, at least not in that moment, truly believing what God has said is true. Paul prays three things to be a reality in these believers lives first of all he prays that the christian have wisdom and the knowledge of god look at it again remembering you in my prayers that okay what is he remembering that the god of our lord jesus christ and then a further qualifier the father of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Do you see how Trinitarian that verse is? All three members of the Trinity are mentioned in the same verse. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And the Father and the Son and the Spirit as the one true and living God work on behalf of the believer according to Paul's prayer that they may have wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him now think about that what is the source of all wisdom god's word god is the source of all wisdom and he has revealed himself to us through his word and the spirit inspired that word and now the spirit is the interpreter 
of that word in the life of the believer. The Spirit illumines the text. How many of you can remember, some of you are right there right now, in school, in literature, reading a story and asking yourself, what is this author talking about? You have no clue. You're just, you're just lost in a fog. What if the author of the book came in to your reading room and sat down beside you and said, let me tell you about this book. Let me explain this to you. Shakespeare walks in and said, listen, I know I used a lot of big words. Let me break it down and help you understand exactly what I'm saying. You have that in the person of the Holy Spirit. The writer of the book indwells you and gives you eyes to see and a heart to understand the words he has written. And anybody, it's what's, uh, the, the doctrine is called the perspicuity. You just say that at, at, at lunch today. It'll impress for friends and family. You know. per, have you considered the perspicuity of Scripture? The perspicuity of Scripture is the clarity of Scripture. Scripture is clear in its meaning. In other words, if you have a basic apprehension of reading skills, okay, if you can read at a sixth grade level or thereabouts, you can read the words of Scripture and understand what the language is saying. But you can be an expert in the field of literature and if you do not have the Holy Spirit, you cannot understand the meaning of the words of Scripture. It takes the Holy Spirit to add that actual author, uh, authorial intent. What did he actually mean as he wrote it? So, he's the one who reveals the truth of God in the first instance, and then he's the one who illumines our minds in order that we may grasp it properly. So Paul's not saying that Christians should expect to receive new revelations from God and become kind of contemporary apostles as we see in so many circles today. I got a word from the Lord last night. No, you didn't. Unless you opened your Bible. Because, and I don't say that flippantly, but the point being, if, if God gave you a special revelation and it's contrary to God's word, then it's false. And if God gave you a special revelation and it matches God's Word, it's not necessary. It was already in God's Word. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying. God certainly leads us. He impresses His desires upon our hearts. He guides us, right? But He does not give us new revelations. He has revealed Himself in the canon of Scripture. Okay? So I know what, most people when they say God told me, they don't mean that they hear an audible voice. They just mean for the most part, God, God led me to understand this or that. And that's just better language to use than God told me because that might leave the wrong impression. Now some people believe that God told them. They believe God came to them in a vision and God can do anything that he wants to, so that's not beyond the realm of possibility. But the question is, that is begged is, why? What's, what's the purpose of it if he's already given his word to us? So the next thing that he prays is Christians must hold fast to the hope of our calling and riches. Think about this. He owns all the heavens, numberless worlds, but notice what the verse says. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints. Think about how that is worded. Look at it again. What are the riches of His glorious inheritance? Who is the object of the pronoun His there? God, whether you want to say it's the Father or Jesus, it doesn't matter, it's God. The riches of God's inheritance in the saints. That's us. That's believers. The redeemed 
according to this verse and in other verses, the redeemed of the Lord, that's saved folk, okay? Put it simply, saved people are worth more to God than the universe and everything in it. Why? Because, not because we in and of ourselves are valuable, but because God has made us valuable by redeeming us for himself, thereby, thereby displaying his glory. When a painter puts their painting on display, the painting glorifies the artist. It reflects the artist. You as the royal priesthood, a holy people, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, are to be the reflection of the goodness and the glory and the graciousness and the forgiveness and the mercy and the patience and the long-suffering that God has shown toward us. We ought to be delirious with this truth. And Paul prays that we will see this with the eyes of our heart, that it will be ingrained in our being. According to verse 11, in the earlier part of chapter 1, men and women who first hoped in Christ are His chosen people. They have been claimed by Him as His portion, as His inheritance. And Gentile believers too have been sealed and guaranteed by God's Holy Spirit with their full and final redemption as His prized possession. God has made them His own. They're His possession. And He will redeem them. You know, there's a lot of metaphors in Scripture about the relationship between the church and God, the church and Christ. Um, and, and they help us fill out what, what's being said in these verses. So think about it with me. As the bridegroom is not complete without the bride, right? If there's no bride, he can't rightly be a bridegroom. He may be a bridegroom hoping to have a bride, but without a bride, he's not really a bridegroom, right? A vine is incomplete without branches. Shepherd is incomplete without sheep. Go, go, to, go to Walmart in the parking lot after church this afternoon and ask someone, who are you? And they say, a shepherd. And there's no sheep around. He may be a shepherd by vocation, but at that particular moment, he's not a shepherd because he's not shepherding sheep. By definition, shepherds shepherd sheep. A head is incomplete without a body. So the church is the complement of Christ. Now I want you to think about that. I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to consider something at a deeper level of consideration just for a moment. Christ is perfect, right? There's no need that He has. Uh, God did not create the universe because He was lonely. There is perfect social harmony within the Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are perfect within themselves. They don't need anything external. To, there's nothing necessary beyond them. Okay, It's a technical term for it, right? They, they are their own being. This is called the aseity of, of God. But they created the world. Now, notice this. Look at what it says. And what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of His great might? Now look at the end of the last couple of verses is where I want to camp out until we close here in just a second. And He put all things under His feet, under Christ's feet, and gave Him as head over all things to the church, which is the body, the... Now listen to this, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. The body, the church, completes Christ. Listen to how 
Calvin described this reality. This is the highest honor of the church that unless He is united to us, unless Jesus is united to the church, the Son of God reckons Himself in some measure imperfect, incomplete. Think about that. Christ says He is not complete without His church, without His body. And what an... Calvin goes on to say, what an encouragement it is for us to hear that not until He has us as one with Himself is He complete in all His parts or does He wish to be regarded as whole? Do you think about the significance of what is being said here? That the church is the gift of the Father to the Son. And He has such an affinity, a love, and a devotion to His bride that God Himself, in the person of Jesus Christ, is incomplete without her. That is significant for who we are. Now, don't misunderstand. that I'm no way saying that Christ in His being, or to say ontologically, who He is in His being, is somehow less complete without the church. That's not, that's not what I'm saying at all. He's perfect and, and beyond perfection for eternity past and future. What I'm saying is, as He lives out the purpose and plan of God in redemption, He's only complete when He's joined with His bride. And this will be manifested at our last supper with Him gathered at the wedding feast. Or maybe our first supper with Him at the wedding feast. Christians have access to this resurrection power. Now I want to close with this simple point. Now Paul has piled up all of this to convince his readers that God's power working on behalf of believers is incomparable and is able to bring them to salvation. Now, that means that according to verse 23 and 22, all things under His feet and gave Him as head over all things. How many things are all things? All things. Well, we say, but that's not, that can't be so because there's so many things that are bad things that go on that are not under the authority of Christ. No, all things, every molecule, every subatomic quark is under the sovereign rule of God and placed in subjugation to the Son. Now, notice this though. For the purpose of giving Him as head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills in all in all. There's not one square inch that God the Father has not placed ultimately under the authority of Christ to the church. And Paul wants his readers to understand and appreciate the divine salvation and in particular the place that they have as God's people in the fulfillment of these divine purposes. What has been done in Christ is for our benefit, right? And available to us. So now... Everything that we do has the possibility of glorifying God in every place that we are, in every situation that we are. So imagine you're frustrated. You don't like your job. You hate your job. You don't get along with your boss. You don't get paid enough. You work too many hours. You know the routine. But how does the gospel speak to that? I know you don't like it. You don't enjoy the time there. But consider 
that every time you walk into that place, because of the reality of the verse we just looked like, looked at, every square inch has been put in subjection to the power of Christ, and you are His ambassador. And you, at that moment, have an opportunity to reflect and call out the glory of God in that place, in your conversations, and in the way you conduct your work, in the way you raise your family at home, that you are the presence of Christ at that point, the fullness of Christ in that particular spot at that particular time. That's what it means to be the body of Christ. So this has tremendous implications for how we live. It's not just about Sunday only. It's about every moment of every day being a disciple. Being an apprentice of Christ. And what is a disciple? One who worships Jesus, is changed by Jesus, and is sent by Jesus. That is the calling for all of us. Let's with great excitement and anticipation burst out of these doors to our mission field. To this land that is not our home. But we have been called to be heralds of the King. And what we're telling the people who are in this land who do not belong to the kingdom of our God, what we are telling them is our king is coming. Prepare for his arrival. And with that we say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Would you stand with me? Father, we love you. We thank you for your word and the richness of it. We can never plumb the depths of Your amazing Word. But it is our joy to spend our life doing so. God, as always, You move in the hearts of people as You desire. And Lord, our desire is that there would be not one person outside of Christ leave this room without knowing who You are the saving power, to recognize that their story has intersected your story. The story of your creation, our fall, your rescue of us, and the soon coming restoration of all things. Move in our hearts in this time of response. In Jesus' name, Amen.